Hello, and thank you for joining us for Public Health in Action, where we discuss various public health issues facing Stanley County and the programs that we provide uh, through the health department here in the county. I'm Dennis Joyner, Health Director with the Stanley County Department of Public Health. Promoting safe, healthy, planned pregnancies is one of the important functions at the health department, and the program that focuses on that uh, uh, program is our family planning program. There's a lot of negative consequences sometimes that can, can occur with unintended and un, unplanned pregnancies, and so we want to try to avoid that through this particular program. Having a baby can be a wonderful experience, uh, but it can also be quite a challenging experience, both financially as well as uh, emotionally. So to help me discuss this topic today, uh, I have with me Patty Lewis, who's a family nurse practitioner at the health department. Thank you for joining me, Patty. I appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for having me. What all is included in the family planning program in terms of services? Well, when you come in for family planning services, we do a complete physical examination on you, and then we do tests based on whatever your indications are by age. For example, women um, receive pap smears starting after the age of 21. We check for sexually transmitted infections for those that are indicated. We can also do lab work such as urinalysis and check for other things based on family history such as high blood sugar or high cholesterol, things like that. So the, the, so you really get a kind of a good workup uh, overall health-wise with, with the initial family planning. That's correct. In fact, a lot of people that don't even have regular medical providers, if they're healthy otherwise, we may be the only health care that they um, routinely see. And then in addition to that, through the family plan and services, we, of course, uh, try to help them make the best decision for them as far as what type of birth control they want to use. Right. Um, we hear a lot about HIPAA, and obviously, in, in terms of thinking about uh, the family planning program and contraceptives and confidentiality and those kind of things, um, HIPAA is very important in terms of uh, that. What, can you explain a little bit about what is HIPAA and how that relates to our family planning services? Well, HIPAA is basically the uh, Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act that was set forth. And what it basically allows us to, or mandates us to do, is to be confidential with the information that we share and exchange so that the people can feel confident that information that's in that clinic will not be shared inappropriately with anybody else. And I, and I guess the, uh, one of the key aspects there is particularly for sexually active teens, um, they can get services there in a confidential manner, correct? That's correct. We do have a state statute that allows us to see teens without parental consent, and they will have confidential care for uh, their birth control needs. The only thing, the exception to that, is if we do encounter a potential life-threatening condition, we are required to report that to parents. Right, right. And, and clearly, uh, part of that is wanting to uh, have a balance between trying to make sure teens have a a safe place to get the medical care that they need, particularly if they've chosen to be sexually active. Uh, but also, um, it's it's important because it um, uh, sort of sets the stage for um, you know, getting getting them into a, a medical home as well, so that they can make sure that we're getting the right uh, they're getting good health care. In, in the process and they're not uh, avoiding coming to get the care that's needed. We absolutely encourage teens to be open and have an open communication with their parents, but if they do feel that that's not possible, you know, then we do have that confidentiality available. Also, you know, we also encourage abstinence. That's the best way to not get pregnant, but um, if not, then, you know, we want to give them an option to help keep them from becoming a statistic. You know, in the state of North Carolina, and 15 to 19 year olds, there's a teen pregnancy rate of uh, 40, almost 50, 50 females per 1,000 females in the state of North Carolina. And in, um, in our county, repeat pregnancies, you have over 26 per 1,000 females as a teen, 15 to 19 wow. year olds that are becoming pregnant for the second time, or greater than greater, second time. Yeah, more than yeah. once. So it's, it's very much out there, and it's a very needed service. Right. Well, it's, uh, I think it's one of those topics that sometimes it's not to, comfortable to talk about, particularly uh, human sexuality in general and teen pregnancy in and of itself, 
creates, uh, you know, people fall on different uh, opinions about it, but the reality is um, uh, we want to try to do all that we can to avoid that unintended pregnancy uh, and hopefully uh, have pregnancies that are planned. Um, can uh, you talk a little bit about, you, you mentioned the initial visit and the initial examination. What, what is in the um, yearly annual visits related to family planning? So when you come in for an initial visit, that's a much more in-depth visit and it takes longer, obviously. Um, it takes well over an hour uh, as opposed to the follow-up visits, the annual visits. Initial visit, we're gathering a lot of information about your personal health history, your family health history, and any types of surgeries you've had, operations, medications, histories as far as nutrition, things like that. And all that helps guide us to where we need to counsel you for helpful things that you might need to know as well as to help us decide to help you make the best decision for what might be the best type of contraception for you. The annual visits are basically a follow-up on that. So if you've had any changes in your medical history, so they don't take nearly as long as the initial visit, but the initial visit's very comprehensive and then annual evaluates for any changes, but you still get your complete physical exam with every um, annual subsequent follow-up visit. Okay. Do you find many times that people will maybe switch or change uh, methods at that point? I guess it's uh, always a possibility. It's not uncommon at all. And that's one reason a lot of times when we initiate a visit, we'll have them come back before the whole next year is up to follow up to make sure they're doing okay with it. Um, if it's pills or something like that, to make sure they're content with that. If they're having any problems with adherence, any side effects, uh, blood pressure's okay, things like that. Some things require you to follow up more often, like depo, you have to come every three months for the depo prevair injection, but some things you don't necessarily need to come more often than that. But if you do choose to change method, we also encourage people, if they do decide they don't like the method they're on, not to wait to come right. back the following year, not just stop using it all together, right. but to, to contact us and we can work out something else for them if there's a problem with their method. Right. Very good. Who receives um, services through the Family Planning Clinic? I mean, the, the scope of folks that we serve. We can see anyone that's childbearing age, that's female, which starts as soon as they start having periods, they're potentially able to get pregnant on through menopause when they quit having periods, as long as they have not had a tubal uh, ligation, so a permanent sterilization, um, or the e plugs, or if they've had a hysterectomy. But anybody that's uh, potentially able to become pregnant is able to come through the family plan and services. And in terms of the cost or charges for the service, if you could talk a little bit about that. Well, we have uh, Title X funding that helps us to be able to provide services at a much reduced and potentially even negligible cost to the patients. We see them on a sliding fee scale, uh, which is based on their income. So they tell us what their income is based on their household size, and we determine on a percentage fee what they may need to pay, which may be as much as 100%. It may be as little as 0%. We can also see people that have uh, regular Medicaid or people that have something called family planning Medicaid, which provides the physical and the birth control method of their choice with no charge to them uh, as opposed to, but it only co covers family planning. It doesn't cover all Medicaid services like sick visits or things like that. And then also another uh, group of people that we do see are people that even have like the Affordable Care Act insurance, marketplace insurance, where they have a very high deductible. Sometimes it's more financially feasible for them to come to us. We do not file or accept insurance, but if people have a very high deductible and based on their income, it may actually still be financially less expensive for them to come and receive their services through there because of the reduced rate for birth control options and for the physical exam. So it's a wide variety of folks. Uh, that we're able to meet and typically um, it's it's the whole idea is to try to make it as affordable as, as possible and for the most part we're able to do that and certainly f for teens uh, it, it typically is an affordable uh, service. And there's a lot of people that even with insurance uh, if they have the high deductibles or high co-pays the cost of pills may be cost prohibitive so they may be right. doing without so we don't want to have that barrier stand in the way and let them have an unintended pregnancy right. if we can help it. Right. 
What are the methods of uh, birth control that are available through the family planning clinic? We have a wide variety. We have uh, what they call short-acting and what they call long-acting methods of birth control. Your short-acting are things that are more quickly in and out of your system, more reversible, which would be things like the birth control pills, the uh, patch that you can put on your body, the, there's a ring, a vaginal ring that you can put in for birth control, and then we also have the intermediate in between that is like the Depo-Provera injection, that's every three months. Then we have more long-acting birth control options, which would be things like the intrauterine device. There's two different types of that. And then also we have um, the next Nexplanon rod that is placed in your arm. Are, and all of those are available through the family planning clinic. I mean, that's actually correct. Can provide and we it. can also do counseling. Not many people use it, but there is natural family planning, which is based mm -hmm. on what some people used to call the rhythm method, where it's based on when you have your period and what your fertile time of month is kind of thing. So we can do counseling for that also. And we also offer condoms. The, uh, uh, is there a, I mean, would you, would you venture to guess what are, what's the uh, most common methods that you typically see? Well, we see a big blend. The most common probably is, is the pills and the depo injection. But a lot of it depends on, you know, the age of the person um, and why they are using birth control if they're planning on getting pregnant anytime soon or if it's going to be a ways off. The younger people a lot of times may not want to do pills because they may forget to take them, although we, you know, they can set their alarms on their phones or something to remind them. But sometimes they do better with a longer acting if they want to get through school before they have to worry about getting pregnant. So maybe the rod that goes in their arm is good for three years may be a better option for them. Or the depo shot where they only have to get it every three months and not have to worry about taking a pill every day. Or right. Particularly if maybe it's something they don't want their parents to know about. They don't have to worry about somebody finding their pills. Their pills, yeah. <coughs> yeah. And the, um, um, over the years, I know back uh, when I was a lot younger, there was a lot of question and concern sometimes about safety of you know, birth control pills and all of those kinds of things. Uh, there's been a lot of advancements made in contraceptives over the years. Could you just speak just a little bit about the safety of uh, the types of methods that are used? Well, there's obviously a risk of sorts to any type of method that you mm -hmm. use other than abstinence. Um, even with condoms, I mean, you have the potential for a latex allergy if you're allergic to latex, right. so they can use a non-latex condom. but. Pills, IUDs, any, any type of birth control has a potential risk for a complication. That being said, the risk for complications from that is lower than the risk of complications from childbirth. So that in and of itself is okay. Plus, if you make them, help them make the best decision for which type of birth control is most appropriate, you can avoid some of the complications. Some women that have had clots in the past or family history of clots may not be best suited to use an estrogen-based birth control. People that have a lot of depression, sometimes the progestin-only methods like the Depo shot or the Mirena IUD may worsen that, so that may not be the best option for them. So a lot of it's based on their family history and what would work out best for them. But there's a, there's a risk for, for anything with any type of birth control out there. Yeah. And I think that's probably one of the good things is we're able to, because of the volume and seeing it on a uh, regular basis, hopefully we're able to help them make the right adjustment to selecting the one that, uh, that is best for them. And the IUDs, uh, there was a big concern a, a few good years back because they had some that were had odd shapes and yeah. they would have problems with them becoming embedded in the walls. Yeah. That's no longer, that particular type of device is no longer available. And the ones they're using now, the Paragard is the copper one that's actually been around for many, many years and has a high safety profile. So there's very, very rare, even though I said there are potential risks, the risks are low and or the low. side effects are yeah. low. Well, and I think that's uh, through the years, that's where I was headed that, uh, you know, yes, there's risk, but it's, they're, they're typically much less risky than uh, they were years and years and years ago. Um, even with the estrogen, the estrogen used to use a lot higher dose. Right. Women would have higher side effects. They'd have a lot more nausea breast tenderness, uh, vaginal yeast infections, and, and clots. They would, the higher estrogen increase their risk for blood clots. So they're even using less estrogen now, but finding it still sufficient to be effective for not allowing pregnancy to occur. Very, very good. Um, 
there are some permanent methods of birth control. Um, could you talk about that a little bit and why folks would uh, choose to do that? Obviously, it's uh, um, quite different than reversible. Right. People that know they no longer want any children, whether it be for some extremely strong medical reason they shouldn't have it or just because they've had all the children they care for, whatever the case may be, they can choose to do something like a bilateral tubal ligation where they cut, clip, burn, whatever. They keep the tubes from being in proximity with each other so you're no longer able to get pregnant. Or there's another procedure called the eShore procedure that basically puts plugs into the tubes that keeps the sperm from getting in and causing um, for t the egg to be fertilized. So both of those two are permanent methods. As well as optimally, you can do things like drastically hysterectomy and yeah. things like that if it's indicated. That's obviously. But the two main ones are like the tubal ligation and the eShore. Right. And those are on the female side. And of course, the male side. is... Uh, mastectomy would be the male equivalent of that. And all of those are procedures we're not able to do at our facility, or, but we are able to make referrals to the appropriate people if they choose to have that done. Right. Very good. Um, and you've talked a, a little bit about the, the, the more temporary methods of birth control and the, um, I guess the advantages and disadvantages uh, that people have to weigh really comes down to sort of what their lifestyle and health indications are. Is that pretty much the case? That's correct. That's correct. Some people, uh, one of the biggest things that people take into consideration is what they want to have as far as their period. Some women don't like having periods, so you can do things that cycle you through your period. Or the Mirena IUD actually is a very good IUD for women that are approaching menopause when they start having very, some of them may have very heavy crampy periods, mm -hmm. long extended bleeding, become anemic, that actually shortens their period, lightens the flow, so that's a very good option for some of those women. People that like to know exactly when they're going to have their periods, those are the people that do better with the birth control pills because they're more cyclical and they're regular and they know what to expect, when to expect yeah. it. So a lot goes into that particular play. Um, one thing that we need to point out and spend a little bit of time talking about is that while in preventing the unintended pregnancy is sort of a key focus, uh, obviously because of uh, sexual activity, uh, other consequences can occur, such as STDs, and we want to be clear that we talk a little bit about, uh, about that as well. That's also included in the family planning visit and discussion. Could you explain how that kind of weaves into the mix? Sure. The people that are 25 and younger, it's standard, <coughs> excuse me, standard of care for them to get checked routinely, whether it be the health department or even if they go to a OBGYN, to check them for chlamydia and gonorrhea because unfortunately a high number of women may have that and not really have any symptoms with it unless it gets to a progressed stage. So. That's something that they find out a lot of times on accident, which is a good thing to find out so that you can treat them. We also offer to check for HIV and syphilis, which is a blood draw versus the swab that we do for the chlamydia and gonorrhea at the health department. Some places even do like a urine collection for chlamydia and gonorrhea, but it's also used for any woman over 25 if they've had change in sexual partners or if they have an abnormal appearance to the uh, discharge that they have, we can check that also whether they're over 25 or not. Mm -hmm. So it's very important. We have a very unfortunately high rate of teens with sexually transmitted infections in our county. So, you know, this is a good opportunity for us, even if they don't come in for STD check and routinely, if they come in for family planning, we find things by accident a lot of times, which is good. Right. But approximately 50% of the STDs we have of chlamydia and gonorrhea in our county occurs in our teens 12 to 18 years old. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, uh, the question comes up oftentimes. Uh, we, we've been fortunate in our county to see, a, and statewide and nationally, a downward trend in uh, teen pregnancy rates, which is always great, but I, I'm quick to point out that our experience is that, you know, uh, approximately half of the STDs that we're seeing um, at least at the health department, are occurring among, among teens. So clearly that is a concern and um, family planning methods or contraceptive methods um, um, for the most part 
many of them will not provide the protection for the STD. Um, that's exactly right. And we also encourage them, you know, that's part of our counseling that even, even if you're not going to get pregnant, you still can get sexually transmitted infections. So even if they're using a type of method for birth control, we still strongly encourage condoms unless you're in a monogamous relationship. Right. Well, I think that's the, uh, um, um, one of the important aspects. <laughs> While there can be the unintended uh, pregnancy, you can also have the unintended STD. And uh, uh, both carry certain consequences that we have to uh, deal with. Right, and we also do still uh, screen for and encourage the Gardasil vaccine for the human papilloma virus, which helps right. decrease their risk for cervical cancer or genital warts. Right, that's a good point. And that's usually, then that can be uh, provided at what age? What, when is it? Really? Up to 18, eight? we can give it for free. They can start receiving it as young as nine. They usually recommend starting around 11. But you do want to start it before teens become sexually active to decrease their risk of getting any infection. Right, and uh, cancer prevention there is, is the most critical piece there. Um, Making an appointment, can you talk a little bit about the logistics of getting a family planning appointment at sure. the health department? All you have to do is call 704-986-3099 and you can speak to the person that handles making those appointments. If she's not available, she's on the line with someone else, you can leave a message. We try very hard to return them within the same day if it's early enough in the day. If not, we return calls within 24 hours to try to set up an appointment. For initial visits, they can't um, be on their menstrual cycle. That's about the only thing, but um, we do need them to come for an initial visit, and that she will give them all that information when they come. She'll tell them everything they need to know, like they need to bring proof of income, or if they have Medicaid or family Medicaid, you know, to make sure that we're aware of that service. Um, if they're transferring from somewhere else, if at all possible, it's helpful to have records that they bring with them from somewhere else. But she'll give them all that information, approximately how long your first visit will take, and set up an appointment that's um, hopefully convenient for them. Very good. Well, is there anything else that you would like to share with our audience? Well, I think uh, one of the other things that we do offer at the health department is free condoms. Mm -hmm. All you have to do at the front desk is ask for a brown bag, and they can give you a bag of condoms. So if in between times, if you run out of condoms, need condoms, if you want to use them for s protection for STDs or for birth control, either one, free of charge, all you have to do is ask. Yeah, and that's no appointment necessary for that's that. That's right. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you, Patty, uh, joining us uh, for this program and discussing it. it human sexuality and, and the whole questions around uh, birth control is a, uh, oftentimes a challenging one to, to discuss. and uh, while we, one of the things that we want to certainly encourage in the community is, is open and candid discussion about it, particularly as uh, we talk with teens um, about it with their um, family, their parents, uh, but also in situations where they're unable to talk with, uh, with family members. Certainly, we want to be there to help provide uh, the information that's needed to avoid unintended pregnancies here in Stanley County, and along with that, uh, the unintended STDs that go along with that. So I appreciate you being with us today. My pleasure. So until we meet again, I hope you all have a very healthy day. Thank you.